All right. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Clark, for the music. And for those to whom this is applicable, let me say to you, Happy Mother's Day on, on this day in May, the second Sunday of the month of May. It's always Mother's Day. I was saying on my radio show this last Thursday, talking about Mother's Day, that uh, uh, a question I put out there, and nobody called me, which I'm not surprised, but... Uh, uh, you, you, you know, gentlemen, are, are you married? And if you're married, does your wife have children, either yours or that from a previous relationship? And if so, do you give your wife a Mother's Day card? It's a simple question. Nobody called in to answer, but some of the guys at the radio station, they, they said, no, no. I go, why? I do. I give my wife one all the time. Now, why did this come to my mind? Well, because... When I was a teenager, I'm making a card out for my mom, and I turned to my dad, and I said, Dad, did, what, what card did you get for mom? And he said, I didn't get anything. I said, what? And he said, she's not my mother. She's the mother of your children, Dad. So th that, that's the question. On this Mother's Day, gentlemen, if your wife is a mother, did you get her a Mother's Day card? Just a rather interesting question. I did. Because she is the mother of my children. We also sent a card to Mariah this week because although she's our daughter, she's clearly not our mother, but she is a mother. She's a mother of our grandchild and soon to be of our grandchildren. So uh, just an interesting debate. Nobody called me in today uh, or, or call, called up this week to talk about it, but that, that was on my mind. And uh, this being Mother's Day, for those of you who, who it applies, Happy Mother's Day. And if you have followed me in these last 11 years, you know that on Mother's Day, as well as on Father's Day, I like to, to uh, preach about a, a, a woman on Mother's Day and a man on Father's Day, not necessarily a mother or a father. Uh, it's much easier to find a man to preach on him because, look, folks, in the scripture text, trying to find a positive father role is rather hard to do. It's much easier to find positive mother roles in the scripture text. But this year, I'm looking at this passage in 1 Kings, which I'll get to in a moment. Before I get there, I want to tell a story. Ah, let's pray before I go any further. God, I thank you now for this day, and we thank you for your blessing and your grace and for the music that we've heard uh, through Clark and for however we take in this day that we call Mother's Day. Uh, there are those to, that can call their mom up today and say hi. There are those of us. Uh, like Larry and myself sitting here, who can only remember our mothers. Uh, and hopefully that's a joyous memory. So God, we thank you for that. And guide us now in your word and in this day. We thank you and pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. For years, I listened to the radio show of Dr. Laura Schlesinger. Some of you may have, have done so when she was on the air. Uh, Dr. Schlesinger, a psychologist who was actually born and raised in Catholicism, she then married her husband, Mr. Schlesinger, and she converted to Judaism. And much of her show was really based on those two facts, her, her, her foundation in Catholicism, and then her conversion to, to, to Judaism and, and, and what that meant. And many of the phone calls that she would get in a psychological statement she would talk to, uh, something I miss about Dr. Laura Schlesinger's show, every Thanksgiving, she didn't do a normal call-in show where let's talk about what's going on in your life. <laughs> she had a, did, did you ever listen to you know, she done Thanksgiving? She had an open mic day for people who wanted to tell jokes. <laughs> Thanksgiving. It was an interesting show every Thanksgiving. I couldn't wait to hear that show. And people telling her, I mean, incredibly corny jokes. Some of them really funny. But just... Uh, uh, an enjoyable show, her, her honesty, uh, sometimes even her brutality. Uh, but there's one show that she did, and I don't remember why. It may have been around Mother's Day. I don't remember. But she talked about the movie which she probably hated more than any other film that she ever saw. And it was the film Sophie's Choice. Now, to this day, I've never seen Sophie's Choice. I know that Meryl Streep was nominated for Academy Award for that film. She might have even won it. I'd have to look it up. And I know the film was also nominated as uh, Film of the Year for the Academy Awards. I don't believe it won. Well, I've never seen it, 
But after hearing Dr. Laura Schlesinger talk about it, I don't think I ever will. She thought the film was absolutely horrid. Sophie's choice, what is the choice that Sophie has to make? Well, Sophie is a Jewish woman in Germany during the Holocaust, and she is grabbed and sent to a concentration camp with her two children. And it's in that concentration camp she's given her choice. And the people in the concentration camp tell her, look, one of your two children needs to die. And you need to pick which one it's going to be. And Dr. Laura said, you know, I can't imagine a woman anywhere who all things being equal and of a healthy mind and spirit would ever make such a decision. She said, I, I can't think of a mother that I have known that wouldn't say, I tell you what, if somebody has to die here, let it be me. Let my children live. But the choice that Sophie is told to make is pick which one of these two children will die. And, and, and this is what's so incensed Dr. Laura Schlesinger is that in the movie, she chooses one of them to die. How does a mother come to that point? How do you say, I'll choose this one over that one? How do you do that as a mother? And so in the movie, Sophie makes a choice, kill this one. And then ha, 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 hardy, 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 here comes the joke of the whole movie. They kill both of them anyway, right in front of her. Dr. Laura said, I'll never watch that film again. She says, the mere fact that the woman made a choice to choose one of her children, she says, I'm sorry. There's just something wrong about whoever wrote that story. Today's reading, in a way, is a lot like Sophie's choice. It's from 1 Kings chapter 3. The Kings ends after Samuel, after 2 Samuel, when David dies. And the kingdom gets passed on to Solomon, David's son, who in the younger years of his life, I highly admire. I, I have real problems with older Solomon. But in his younger years, he's known as a man who follows God, and he's known for his wisdom. And in 1 Kings chapter 3, we see one of those stories about this wisdom that he has. And beginning in verse 16 and going through the end of the chapter, it says this in New International Translation. Now two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The, the king would sit in judgment during the day and people would come and bring their cases in before him, a lot like Moses did centuries before. They would come to him and, and he would hope for the wisdom of God to, to help settle their disputes or their claims or whatever the case may be. These two women, who by the way, rather interesting, are both prostitutes, and they come before the king. They have a case they want to bring before the king. One of them said, my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house. I had a baby while she was there with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There was no one in the house but the two of us. During the night, this woman's son died because she lay on it. So rolled over in the middle of the night. So she got up in the middle of the night and she took my son from my side while I, your servant, was asleep. She put him by her breast and she put her dead son by my breast. The next morning I got up to nurse my son and he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't the son I had born. The other woman said, no, the living one is my son, the dead one is yours. And the first one insisted, no, the dead one is yours, the living one is mine. So they argued before the king. And so, so here he is, he's sitting there taking judgment. Two women are arguing. They both agree a son is dead. The question is, which one is dead? Now, the first woman says, when I looked at my son, I knew this wasn't him. These boys are three days apart. Now, often you can go into a, to a, a, a nursing station and see a bunch of newborns and they all have the tendency to look alike. They all look like Winston Churchill. Uh, <laughs> that's an old joke. But having had two children of my own, you hold them, you know what their face looks like. 
You may know their smells, you may know their sounds. There may have been a, a mole at a particular place, but this woman says, this is not my son. Not to mention, if she's right in the story she's telling, this child is three days younger than her own. The second one is saying, no, that dead child is yours. The living one is mine. What, what do you do? And so the king said, this one says, my son is alive and your son is dead. While that one says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. Then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword for the king. He then gave an order, cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive was filled with compassion for her son and said to the king, please, please, my lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill the child. By the way, Larry, it says him. Larry was asking, he's a boy, and this is before the sermon started. So there is, there is a masculine him. Don't kill him. But the other one said, neither I nor you shall have him. Cut him in two. And then the king gave his ruling. Give the living baby to the first woman. Do not kill him. She is his mother. When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. This is the reading of God's holy word. May he grant us understanding this day. Now, now that's what the book First Kings attributes to this is Solomon's wisdom. And, and I, I think you do come to a, a good, wise decision here, but there, I think there's something a little bit basically more fundamental going on here in this story. And it has everything to do with Dr. Laura Schlesinger hating the film Sophie's Choice. What mother in a right mind, and all things being equal, would want to choose to see their child killed? She's arguing with a woman, that's my child, and, 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 and everything is fine until Solomon says, well, I tell you what, I can't, defy, I can't decide between two of you, so let's just cut the baby in half, and each one of you take one half, everything's fine. Well, what's going to end up if that ends up being done is neither one of them has a living child. Well, the one woman, no, no, let her have it. Why? I think we can all put this together in our own mind. This woman, this mother, will do anything to keep her baby alive. Even making a decision that that child will be raised by somebody else, even though she knows it's not her child. I will do anything to keep my child The second woman, who apparently was right, been told from the first woman, that wasn't her son anyway, so she's okay with the decision, hey, kill it. I mean, in one sense, I lost mine, so you can lose yours. I'm fine. It wasn't her child. This woman would do anything to keep her child alive, including losing him. Let her have it. And so Solomon, in the wisdom that's attributed in the scripture text, sees which one really is the mother and says, give it to her. Now, one thing I've often thought about in this story is the whole deal in Israel with false testimony. It never says, because this is where the story ends, it doesn't say whether that second woman, did he ever try to mete out any kind of justice on her? You lied about whose child this is, I can tell by the fact that you didn't care whether it died or not, as opposed to this woman will do anything to make sure it's alive. Why would you do that? I, it, it, it's not in there. And that's part of the story that I want to know. Why would you do that? Is it, is it jealousy? You have what I don't have and therefore I want? It's kind of interesting because one of the things that comes to my mind thinking about that very question is the Ten Commandments. You know, the first four deal with relationship with our God and then our parents. 
Those that come after that are centering around how we deal with each other. And what's one of the things that we're told? Thou shalt not, what? Covet. Covet. Thy neighbor's ox, thy neighbor's ass, thy neighbor's wife, thy or neighbor's child. husband. What's that? Child. Thy neighbor's child. And this woman, the second woman, is angry. She's hurt. I can understand that. But to try to, to take. And then when it gets caught in the act, I'd rather see this child die than that woman has it. What kind of bitterness is in somebody's life? But that first woman. Bright and vain with what Dr. Laura Schlesinger said. What woman in any right mind? would want to make a decision that would end up in the death of their child. This woman says, give it to him. The child is still alive. You know, there's another story in the scripture text of a woman who has a very similar choice to make. A woman who gives birth to a son at a time when the orders from headquarters was that any male child that is born shall be put to death. Who am I talking about? Moses. Moses' mother. Moses' mother was faced with this. Pharaoh was so tired of how rapidly the Jews are reproducing that he orders the death of all male children that are Jewish. And, and, and Moses' mother gives birth to a son. What is she not going to do? She's not going to see the death of this son. So what does she do? Well, she tries to keep the child until it gets to the fact where it's noisy. And then she puts it in a basket and puts it in the river and sends it on down the river. At the same time, she sends her daughter, the child's sister, to follow along to see what happens with this basket. And then when the basket is found by the daughter of Pharaoh himself, the very guy who issued the decree that this child should die, this woman finds this baby. And part of that story that's always fascinated me, she says, this is one of the Hebrew children. And, and I wonder, how does she know? Well, one of two ways. Either the blanket that it's wrapped in or the fact that to see whether it's a male or a female child, she unwrapped the child from the swaddling cloths and noticed what? Circumcision. Who's the ones who practice that? Jews. And so the woman says, this is one of the Hebrew children. What I find interesting about the story, she doesn't say, well, then let's kill it because that's what my father decreed. No, no, she's looking at this child. She's holding this child. Next thing you know, up comes this little Jewish girl. Now she has no idea this is the child's sister. And she says, oh, if that's a Hebrew child, would you like me to go get one of the Hebrew midwives to nurse this child and to raise it for you until it's time to weaning? Then you can have it back. And, and, and Pharaoh's daughter says, excellent idea. So who gets the baby back? Moses' mother, I, I think that's one of the most wonderful stories in the scripture text. She gives the child up. She's not going to see it killed. She gives the child up just to get it back again. And she raises this child until she wings it. And then, I think probably joyfully and happily, even though filled with sorrow, she gives it to Pharaoh's daughter because there's something she knows. In the hands of Pharaoh's daughter, this child's gonna have things that she can never provide for. Some of the women I've talked with on a private matters over the years, that's why some women I know, as much as it has torn them apart inside, have made the decision to adopt their child. Some, some we've known right here in Aldersgate, have been blessed to be reunited with that child in adulthood and, 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 and had a wonderful, has a wonderful relationship. To, you know, Terry comes to my mind. Terry Lucas and her daughter Rebecca. She 
reunited with years later as Rebecca is an adult and a mother herself. I think that's a fascinating part of the story of Moses. In the movie, The Ten Commandments, there's an interesting scene. It's not biblical. In other words, you're not going to go to Exodus and find this in it. But on the night of the Passover, in the movie, The Ten Commandments, who's in the room with Moses that night as they're having the Seder? Two women. Actually, three. His wife his own mother, and Pharaoh's daughter. I have always been moved by that scene. Because here are the women and his wife. All three of them are in the room. All three of them are being covered by the blood of the lamb. And their lives are spared. So you have a woman who gave a child up who, as an adult, reunites with her. And you have the woman that raised him, who, as an adult, says, can I come and spend this night with you? And she's told, yes, you may. In fact, if you read the book of Exodus, anyone who's on the inside of the doors, regardless of who they are, the angel of death will pass over. I found myself in agreement with Dr. Laura. How many mothers would choose their life over the life of their child? Not too many that I know of. <laughs> My mother was an athlete. And if you knew her in her last years of life, you would have known that when she was somewhere between 78 pounds and 90 pounds and dying of the emphysema that she had for 20 years. But my mother was an athlete, a high school star athlete, track, basketball. My, my mother averaged 30, 50 points, I'm sorry, 30 points a game in women's basketball in 1951. My mother was one of the first people, first women, to receive an athletic scholarship to LSU. She had one half scholarship to LSU on athletics, one half scholarship for being an English major. My mother was an athlete. Uh, I don't know how many of you, when you were in elementary school, uh, were embarrassed to say that your mother could outrun you. Larry? No, no. My mother could outrun me. Oh, uh, because my mother was fast. <laughs> Now, why am I laughing about this and why am I thinking about it? About the fact that mothers want to protect their children. We had a kid in our neighborhood who was picking on my sister. And when my mother came out to put a stop to it, he called my mother a word, which my mother hated with an absolute passion. Rhymes with rich. Mm -hmm. Upon that, this kid found out that my mother was a track star. <laughs> As she's chasing him down the road, she just about had him when he ran inside the, the, his house and tried to slam the door. My mom pushed the door open and, and, and started to go inside the house and then Logic hitter, I'm chasing some kid into his house for the whole intention of causing him harm. <laughs> and she stopped and she backed out. About that time, this guy's very inebriated mother started coming up. Uh, she lost that argument with my mom that day. But to see, the thing about that is my sister and me too, by connection, in fact, she's my sister, knew that day nobody messes with me, but you gotta mess with who? Mom. Mom. <laughs> Never forget that. What's really funny is, a couple months later, that guy called my mom that same word, only this time my dad was outside the house and he found out my dad was faster than my mom. <laughs> funny stories that you have when you're a child.
Cut him in two. Give it to both. No. Let her have it. Why? Probably because she'd rather die than see something happen to her child. A lot of us were raised by women like that. Not all of us. I've met people that had terrible relationships with their mothers. And I understand that. Perhaps we can think if our mother had a choice, we probably know with every inch of our being our mother would choose us. And we can be happy in that. Praise be to God. Happy Mother's Day. I'll continue my uh, sermon series on the uh, virtues. No, what did I call it last week? Seven Ch Godly Virtues. Seven Godly Virtues. Change the title in the middle of the, <laughs> of the sermon series. But for this week, folks, happy Mother's Day. And, and look at if your mother's alive, Give her a call. If you've had a problem with your mother for years, now's a good time to, to end that. It's a song by Mike and the Mechanics, which has simple lyrics. It's too late when we die to agree we don't see eye to eye. I'm sure Larry wishes he can call his mom today and call and talk to her. He's nodding. I wish I could do that. If your mother's still alive, realize. Realize the great advantage that you have. Especially if you ask yourself, what would my mother do in one of these situations? And if it was, she will do whatever it could to keep me alive. Give her a call. We wish her happy birthday. And if there is a rift, it's time to mend it. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your blessing. Lord, a story from the scripture text that we can still try to learn something from, we thank you for it. And we thank you for the memories we have and for those of us who can still have a mom we can put our arms around. God, we thank you for that. <laughs> and we thank you for memories like my mom running down the street trying to catch that kid. And I know that I'm going, get him! All right, Lord, I thank you for that memory. <laughs> And your blessing guide us until we meet again. We thank you and pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You guys have a good week.